Outcomes Upper Intermediate, Students' Book, by Hugh Della and Andrew Walkley. Published by National Geographic Learning, a part of Cengage Learning. Copyright 2016. Track 1. 1. Yeah, at the weekends, of course. I go shopping, go to the cinema, go clubbing sometimes. I don't tend to during the week, though because I've got to get up early for school, and I've got homework, and basically my parents prefer me to stay at home. Two. Yeah, all the time. My headphones are glued to my ears. I like all kinds of stuff as well. Rock, pop, even some classical. Three. Not as much as I'd like to, because I really love it. Especially musicals. I mean... I do go now and again, but the seats are so expensive, I can't afford to go more than a couple of times a year. Four. Very rarely, to be honest. I guess I might in the summer, if it's very hot. I find it a bit boring, just going up and down the pool. It's not really my kind of thing, and I'm not very good at it either. Five. Probably less than I think I do if you know what I mean. It's always on in the background, you know, but I don't pay much attention to it most of the time. I will watch a big game if there's one on and the occasional film, but apart from that, most of it's rubbish. Six. Yeah, I guess so. I usually play football on a Wednesday and I go running now and again. I generally cycle to college as well, unless it's raining. Seven. No, not as a rule. I tend to watch films on demand through my TV at home. Oh, and I download quite a lot of stuff too. Eight. Not as much as I used to. I was addicted to this online game for a while until my parents banned me. I'd sometimes play for five hours a day. I play other games now, but my parents control it a bit more. Track two. One. I don't tend to during the week, though. Two. Yeah, all the time. My headphones are glued to my ears. Three. Not as much as I'd like to, because I really love it. Four. Very rarely, to be honest. I guess I might in the summer. Five. I don't pay much attention to it most of the time. I will watch a big game if there's one on. Six. Yeah, I guess so. I usually play football on a Wednesday, and I go running now and again. Seven. No, not as a rule. I tend to watch films on demand through my TV at home. Eight. Not as much as I used to. I was addicted to this online game until my parents banned me. I'd sometimes play for five hours a day. Track three. One. It does nothing for me. It's quite boring, quite dull. Two. It's one of those tunes that's very easy to remember, very catchy. Three. It's hilarious, just really, really funny. Four. It didn't do much for me. It's typical big-budget Hollywood, very commercial. Five. I can't explain it. It's really strange, really weird. Six. It's just too much for my liking, really over the top. Seven. You can't stop reading. It's so exciting, so gripping. Eight. It's good, but it's quite upsetting, quite disturbing. Nine. It's a really inspiring story, really uplifting. Ten. Don't go and see it. It's dreadful, absolutely awful. Track four. So, what kind of things do you do in your free time? I guess films are the main thing. Really? Do you go to the cinema much then? Oh, all the time. I mean, I go at least once a week, but I'll often go two or three times. Wow. That is a lot. Yeah. I mean, it depends what's on. Right. What about you? Do you go much? Now and again, if there's something I really want to see, but I'm happy just to watch at home. Really? But if you're watching an action movie with all the special effects, 
Don't you want to see it on the big screen? Yeah, I guess. But to be honest, I'm not that keen on action movies. Really? I mean, what about X-Men? Or The Hunger Games? Stuff like that? Yeah, The Hunger Games was OK, I suppose. But I'd rather see other things. Actually, there was this great Korean film on TV last night. Old Boy. Oh, yeah. I started watching it. But I turned over. You didn't like it? Not really. It was so over the top. That scene where he eats the live octopus. <laughs> I don't know. It was all a bit too weird for my liking. Didn't you find it strange? I guess it is a bit. But that's what I like about it. They actually did an American remake of it, but I prefer the original. I've seen it loads of times. Really? As I say, it's not really my kind of thing. I prefer a good drama. So, what other films are you into? Oh, all sorts. I mean, I'm really into action films and stuff like that. But I'll watch most things, really. As I say, I go most weeks. So, you know... Have you seen Long Walk to Freedom? Yeah, have you? No, but I've heard it's good. I was actually thinking of going to see it. You should. I was in tears by the end. Really? I thought it was supposed to be a feel-good movie. No, it is, it is. It's really inspiring, really uplifting. He's just such an incredible character. Honestly, it's brilliant. I'll check it out then. Track 5. 1. I'm really into 60s music. The Beatles, the Stones, stuff like that. Yeah, it's not really my kind of thing. It's more the kind of stuff my dad listens to. 2. Do you like Tarantino? I love his films. He's all right, I guess. But I'm not that keen on his films. They're a bit over the top for my liking. 3. Have you ever read any Paolo Coelho? His books are fantastic. I've read one. It was OK, I guess. But it didn't really do that much for me, to be honest. Track 6 Now, if you follow me through into the next room, we come to two paintings by a 17th century Dutch artist who was both widely admired and reasonably successful during his lifetime. Born in Leiden in 1629, Gabriel Metsu moved to Amsterdam around 1655 and produced over 40 major works. Sadly, though, he died at the age of 37, at a time when his career was going particularly well, and since then he has been rather forgotten, which seems a bit of a shame, to be honest. These two pieces were meant to be hung together as companion pieces. In the painting on the left, a young man is writing a letter, and on the right, we see a young woman reading a letter. The viewers are supposed to understand that he is composing a love letter to her, and that here she is digesting it. On the surface, these may look like fairly conventional, fairly realistic pieces, but look more carefully and you soon realize they are actually very open to interpretation. The man appears to be a member of the upper middle classes, and his surroundings create the impression that he's well-traveled. Through the open window, we can see a globe in the room behind him, and there's an expensive Turkish rug on his table. To his right, there's an Italian-style landscape hanging on the wall, which suggests he's a man of the world. Meanwhile, the woman, who is also expensively dressed, seems to belong more to the domestic world. Painted in bolder colors, she looks calm and content as she reads. However, not everything is as it first appears. Beneath the surface of the calm domestic world lies trouble. In the foreground of the painting, we see a tiny thimble, the small china cup you wear on your finger to protect it while you are sewing. Obviously, the woman was so excited to receive her letter that she jumped up in the middle of her needlework. To the right of the picture, we see the woman's maid pulling back a curtain, behind which we see two ships on a stormy sea. This could well be a symbol of the difficult, stormy nature of love, especially when partners are separated. Look carefully, and you'll notice too that the servant has another letter to deliver, presumably to the man shown here. Even he, depicted in darker, more subtle shades, is a victim of the fires of the heart. The rich red of the carpet and the bright light pouring in through the window suggest he has a heated mind. The underlying message now seems painfully clear. Passion can lead to chaos. Track 7 1 
Famously, Van Gogh sliced his ear off. Two. Unfortunately, it couldn't be restored. Three. Incredibly, he was only nine. Four. Obviously, some people will just think it's weird. Five. Hopefully, some will like it. Six. Initially, Picasso's work was quite realistic. Seven. Frankly, they were stolen. Track eight. It's basically about this guy who's a weatherman, and he has to report on this annual festival. It's a small town, and he's living in L.A. and is now a city boy, so he thinks the place is silly, and he's quite arrogant. On top of that, he's been covering the story for several years, and he's bored with it. Well, it would be boring. I guess, but he's kind of laughing at them. At who? The people in the town and the whole festival. Right. Anyway, he does the story, and that night he has a date with this woman, but it's a complete disaster, and he goes back to his hotel, and you know he can't wait to get back to L.A. Right. Anyway, the next day he wakes up, and he hears the same song as he'd heard the previous day. And as the day goes on, he realizes, basically, it is exactly the same day. He's gone back in time. Well, not exactly, because what happens is the next day he wakes up, and it's the same day again, and the same the next day and the next. He's stuck? Exactly. And when he first realizes, he kind of enjoys it, because he, uh, he can, can improve each day to avoid, like, the things he didn't like. And so, for example, his date with the woman improves. And then he realizes he'll never actually ever get together with the woman, because he always has to start the same day. Then, and then he gets depressed and tries to commit suicide. But even when he kills himself, he wakes up again, repeating the same day, and it's like a living hell. Sounds a bit depressing. No, it's hilarious. Really funny. Okay, so how does he escape? I guess he does. To be honest, I forget now, but he does. And you know they all live happily ever after, but it's great. Track 9 Affluent. Grand. Deprived. Hideous. High rise. Historic. Rough. Run down. Stunning. Trendy. Up and coming. Be based. Date back to. Dominate. House. Saw. Knock down. Steer clear of. Renovate. Track 10. What a lovely day. Yeah, it's nice, isn't it? It's been a really warm autumn. So, where are we? 
Well, the bit we've just been through with all the high-rise blocks is what we call New Belgrade. It's the big up-and-coming area as all the new businesses are relocating here. And I don't know if you can see it or not, but just behind us, over to the right, is the arena, which is where all the big concerts and sports events are held. It's one of the biggest entertainment venues in Europe. Yeah, I think I did catch a glimpse of it. You might have seen it on TV. It's the place they held the Eurovision Song Contest. Oh, right. To be honest, I'm not really that keen on Eurovision. It's not really my kind of thing. No? Well, I guess you never win these days. <laughs> anyway, now we're crossing over the River Saba into Old Belgrade. Wow, the river looks wonderful. Yeah, it's great. In the summer, we often go out on little boats or have dinner down by the waterside. Oh, that sounds lovely. And what's that big bridge over there? That's the Eder Bridge. It's quite new, actually. It only opened a few years ago. It's very impressive. It looks even better when it's lit up at night. Mmm. And just down there, there's a little street called Gavrila Principa Street, which is where Manakova Kuka, Manak's house, is located. It's an ethnological museum, and it houses an amazing collection of old national costumes and embroidery and stuff. Okay, I'll check that out if I have time. What's that building over there? Oh, that's St. Mark's Church. Wow, that's a stunning building. How old is it? Not that old, actually. It was built in the late 1930s or something, but it's on the site of a much older church. It contains the tomb of Stefan Dusan, who was perhaps the greatest Serbian emperor ever. Oh, okay. And if you want to walk around here later, you're quite close to the Kalamagdan Fortress, one of the most historic buildings in Belgrade. There's the Victor Monument up there as well, which was erected after the First World War. It's one of the city's most famous landmarks. Right. Well, I'll have to remember to take my camera with me up there then. And now we're coming up to Didinje, which is one of the more affluent parts of the city. It's where all the celebrities and the old aristocratic families live. And a lot of the embassies are based here as well. The houses certainly do look very grand. Yeah, they're amazing. Track 11. One. We're proud to announce that this year we're opening a new wing dedicated exclusively to Asian art. It's taken us over a decade and nearly a hundred million euros to put it all together, but we've been extremely lucky in that we've received some very generous donations, without which none of this would have been possible. The extension is perhaps the most significant and innovative architectural addition to the building in our history. Officially, it's due to open in a couple of months, and having overseen the collection, I can tell you with some confidence that it'll be a sensation. Two. But we don't need it. Yeah, but it's just such a lovely thing. And anyway, if we only ever bought things we actually really need, we'd hardly ever buy anything. Just think of it as a piece of art for the house. Yeah, maybe, I guess... But where are we going to put it? I don't know. We'll find somewhere, I'm sure. It could go in the kitchen, perhaps. Or the living room? It's just asking for trouble. It's bound to get broken. The kids will smash it or the dog will run past and knock it over. Oh, come on. That's not likely to happen. You're worrying about nothing. And anyway, I like it. <sighs> Fine. Suit yourself. Get it, then. How much do they want for it, anyway? Three. They've just opened this new exhibition of old military vehicles, which is supposed to be really good. It opens at ten, so I'm going to go down there tomorrow morning and have a look at that. I'm not sure if it's free to get in or not, though. I guess you might have to pay, but that's OK. I'm sure it'll be worth it. Don't know if tanks are really your thing or not, but if they are, then you might fancy coming along. Just thought I'd suggest it anyway. Give me a bell back when you get this and let me know. Four. Oh, man. I think I'm going to faint. You shouldn't have gone on that ride. Well, it looked quite tame, but all that spinning around has made me dizzy. Oh, I need to sit down. Wait there. I'll go and get you a glass of water. 
Thanks. I'm so embarrassed. Don't worry about it. Just learn your lesson for next time. Five. The club is applying for planning permission to expand the current site by some 20,000 seats, and we're launching a campaign to block this. For many years now, on match days, there have been both transport and antisocial behaviour problems in the area. We believe that any expansion is bound to worsen the situation. We understand the club's desire to boost its income, but we don't believe that all other alternatives have yet been explored. We've nothing against the club in itself, but we're firmly opposed to any development that'll result in further tensions between supporters and local residents. Track 12. 1. This year, we're opening a new wing dedicated exclusively to Asian art. 2. The kids will smash it. 3. It opens at 10. 4. I'm going to go down there tomorrow morning and have a look at that. 5. I think I'm going to faint. 6. I'll go and get you a glass of water. Track 13. 1. There are bound to be problems when the new system is introduced. 2. I think we're due to arrive at something like 20 to 10. 3. If he keeps doing things like that, something bad is bound to happen sooner or later. 4. He is due to appear in court on the 31st of the month. 5. Your mum's bound to worry about you while you're away. It's only natural. 6. She can't travel at the moment, as she's due to give birth any day now. 7. It is technically possible to get a visa to travel there, but it's not likely to be easy. Track 14. 1. It's going to boost the club's income. Two. I'd listen to his stuff all the time when I was younger. Three. I'm sure it'll be worth it in the end. Four. It's likely to present a huge challenge in the coming years. Five. It's due to be completed in 2020. Six. It might take years to repair the damage. Track 15. Conversation 1. What's the name of that stuff you use to put posters up? Can you be a bit more specific? Yeah, sorry, I mean that stuff. It's a bit like chewing gum or something, but it doesn't actually feel that sticky. What? You mean blue tack? Yeah! Is that what they call it? Conversation 2 It's, um, what do you call those things climbers use? They're made of metal. They're like a hook. What? You mean the thing you use to connect yourself to the rope? Yeah, they have a sort of clip thing that opens and shuts. You see people using the small ones as key rings sometimes. Yeah, yeah, I know exactly what you mean. I don't know. Do they have a special name? Aren't they just clips? Track 16. I brought you a present. Wine? No, I know you don't drink. No, it's Californian grape juice. I had some at a friend's the other day and it was really delicious. Really? Apparently they have all sorts of varieties. Yeah, well... Thanks. Should we have some now? Sure. Have you got a corkscrew? Ah, that's a point, actually. I'm not sure I have, actually. Um, let me have a look. Oh, there's so much stuff in these drawers. Most of it's rubbish. I really should clear it out. Hmm, I don't think there's one here. Can't you use a knife? Mm, I don't think so. You need a stick or something to push it down. Would a pencil do? It wouldn't be strong enough. What about a wooden spoon? You could use the handle. Yeah, that should do. Let's see. 
Oh, no. Oh, it's gone everywhere. Oh, sorry. Have you got a cloth? Yeah. I think we need a mop and bucket as well. Sorry. Don't worry about it. These things happen. You might want to rub some salt into that shirt or to leave a stain. Really? Well, it works for other things. Track 17. One. When it arrived and I put it on, it didn't fit. Two. When I took it out of the box, I found the screen was scratched. Three. When I tried to put it together, I realised it had a bit missing. Four. It was supposed to be for sensitive skin, but it gave me spots. Five. When I filled it the first time, I realised it had a leak. Six. I only wore it for a week and the strap came off. Seven. They fell apart after a month. The soles came off. Eight. When I got home and tried them on, I realised the back pocket was ripped. Track 18. Hello. Welcome to Rights and Reason. On today's show, we'll be discussing the importance of dealing with customer complaints in the globalised world, the government's proposed new laws on data protection and privacy, and we'll be giving advice on the hazards of buying a second-hand car. Our first item came out of a post on the Rights and Reason webpage from a Chinese listener, Fei Han. Fei is a visitor to Britain from China, and three weeks ago, he bought a pair of shoes in a well-known store. When he opened the box at home, he discovered one of the shoes had an insole missing. Fei says he put off going back to the store because he was worried about his poor English and didn't want the stress. In fact, he says he even thought about keeping and using them, but unsurprisingly, found them too uncomfortable to walk in. So eventually he took them back, and this is where the problems really started. The assistant told him it wasn't company policy to sell insoles separately, and that he should have checked the shoes at the point of sale. He was even accused of losing the insole himself. The assistant said he could only prove this wasn't the case by checking the CCTV cameras after the store closed that day. Fay left a contact number, but heard nothing and went back three days later. After explaining the situation again to a different assistant, the store manager was called and Faye was finally offered a new insole. Unfortunately, when he got home, he discovered it was the wrong size, at which point he gave up. The incident has clearly left Faye feeling let down and questioning whether this poor treatment was due to him being a tourist. Now, to discuss this case and the wider implications for customer services, we have John Squire from the Institute of Customer Care. Track 19 Welcome, John. So, what do you think of this case? Yes, thank you. I mean, clearly, Faye shouldn't have been treated like that, and given the final outcome, the company hasn't achieved anything by it. It's almost a case study in what not to do. And do you think this happened because he was foreign? Well, possibly, I'm sad to say. But we also know that this can be because of a deeper problem in the company. A culture can develop within companies where it is assumed the customer is at fault or is trying to cheat the company by complaining. That then stops the assistant listening to the issue and thinking about it rationally. OK. So are you saying the customer is always right? No, no, not at all. There are instances of serial complainers who try to exploit companies, and of course sometimes the customer is at fault. However, you should start from the view that they do have a valid point and allow them to speak. Listen. Consider what the customer wants. What's the cost of resolving the situation, even if you do have a doubt? I mean, in Faye's case, even if he was lying, and who on earth loses part of their shoe, how much would replacing that insole cost? Indeed. And there's a bigger cost to poor care, isn't there? Your institutes produced some interesting statistics on this recently. I mean, it's cheaper to keep customers. Absolutely. 
Estimates suggest the cost of retaining a customer is a fifth of the cost of getting new customers, and customers are actually four times more likely to use or recommend a service again if a problem is sorted out efficiently. Isn't that the issue with tourists, though? They're one-time customers, so why bother? Yes, well, I think that's an incredibly narrow view. Many of these stores are global brands, and tourists make recommendations at home. They may also have friends who are local to the UK store, but I think even if that wasn't the case, it still shows a wrong attitude. You know, not all cultures share this approach to complaints. In Japan, they are often made in the spirit of improving a service rather than seeking compensation. We say all companies should see complaints in this way as a gift. For every person who complains, there'll be twenty-five who are also dissatisfied but who said nothing. A person who complains has made an effort. They are providing valuable feedback and reveal how you can improve products and services. If that complainant is foreign, think that they may have additionally overcome embarrassment about their language abilities, like Fay. Companies often pay to get feedback, and here they're getting it for free. In short, the message is: take customer care seriously, whoever the person is, and train your staff to do it well. John Squire, thank you very much. Track twenty. So, what do you think of your president? Oh, I can't stand him. He's so arrogant. Really? Whenever I see him on TV, he comes across as being fairly well intentioned. Ah, it's all marketing. You hear some people say he's boosted our reputation in the world, whatever that's supposed to mean. But he's done nothing for people like me. In fact, he's just put up tuition fees for students. I know. I saw. It's eight thousand euros or something a year now, isn't it? More than that. Really? I don't know how you manage. The cost of living is so high in your country. Tell me about it. I'm going to be so far in debt by the time I graduate. I'll be paying it back for years. Is it easy to find a job there? Well, this is it. Unemployment shot up recently. It's really worrying. If you ask me, they've been so concerned with supposedly green laws like banning plastic bags, they've totally ignored the economy, and now it's a complete mess. So when's the next election? Can't you vote against them? It's next year, but I'm not going to vote. No. No. They're all as bad as each other. The opposition is so busy fighting among themselves that they're not going to make any difference. I know what you mean, but there must be someone worth voting for. I mean, like our government has done a few controversial things, stuff I didn't agree with, but you know, they've done good things as well. I mean, the economy's really booming. Yeah, maybe I should think about emigrating there after uni. You should. Honestly, there's such a skill shortage that companies are paying really good money now. They're desperate for people. You don't think the language would be a barrier? Not necessarily. Quite a few multinationals have set up there recently, and they all use English. And anyway, you'd pick our language up after a while. They've actually done a lot to cut back on bureaucracy too, so it's much easier for foreigners to get work than it used to be. Yeah, I'll have to think about it. It'd be nice to escape my debts anyway. Track twenty-one. I don't know how people can make ends meet. Tell me about it. I can only just get by, and I've got a good job. The job market is so competitive at the moment. I know what you mean, but if you're prepared to be flexible, there's plenty of work. The pace of life is so fast here. I know it's exhausting. I feel like I spend my life just rushing around. There's so much crime. You can't go out at night. Yeah, maybe. Mind you, it's not like that everywhere. 
If you avoid certain areas, it's perfectly safe. They haven't done anything to boost tourism. Yeah, I know what you mean. Mind you, look what they've done to improve poor areas. That's great. This country is so bureaucratic. Tell me about it. I had to fill in four forms in three different places to get a work permit. Track 22. One. The government will today launch a new initiative aimed at getting vulnerable young people off the streets and into hostels. The move is a response to growing concern about the number of teenagers sleeping rough on the streets of the capital, many of whom it is feared are in danger of becoming involved in drugs and other criminal activity. 2. A senior executive at one of the country's leading law firms is today almost half a million euros richer, after winning her case against her employers, McClintock and Rice. Judith Fenton had claimed she was denied promotion as a direct result of telling colleagues she was pregnant. The court ruled in her favour and she was awarded compensation of €487,000. Police are today conducting investigations after a young Asian student was attacked near the city centre by a group of white youths late last night. The attack was captured on CCTV and a senior policeman has announced he believes it may well have been racially motivated. The 19-year-old victim is still being treated in hospital and is believed to have suffered several broken bones. Four. A tiny pressure group has claimed victory over one of the country's richest men. Multi-millionaire Ronald Stamp had been planning to build a hotel and entertainment complex on a privately owned beach on the northeast coast. However, following protests by local residents, the group Save Our Seaside took legal action to prevent what they claimed would amount to vandalism on a huge scale, a claim that was yesterday upheld in court. Five. A woman from East Sussex last week became the country's youngest grandmother. At the age of 29, Tracy Bell is now the proud granny of a baby boy, Kevin. Bell's daughter, Caroline, aged 14, said she had initially been too scared to break the news to her mother and had waited until a doctor had confirmed she was indeed pregnant. Mrs. Bell, however, seems resigned to the situation, stating that as she is already bringing up five children, one more will make little difference. Track 23 Did you see that thing on the news about that woman who's been suing the firm she works for? I was just reading about that, actually. She won, didn't she? Absolutely. It was shocking what happened to her. It was such typical double standards. Well, maybe, but it was a lot of money. I'm not so sure about it all, to be honest. If you ask me, if you're in that kind of situation, you have to decide what you want. Either you try and get promoted or you focus on having kids. You can't have everything in life, can you? That's such rubbish. You can't really believe that. Well, this is the 21st century. Surely a woman's allowed to have children and a career. Track 24. One. It was shocking what happened to her. Two. It just seems a bit excessive. Three. 
Mind you, it was a lot of money. Four. It makes you wonder what's gone wrong with the world. Five. It was such typical double standards. Six. That's good news for a change. Seven. I don't know how they manage. Eight. At least they're doing something about it at last. Nine. You can't have everything in life, can you? Ten. It's a bit of a worry. Eleven. It's lucky it was caught on film. Twelve. That kind of thing shouldn't be tolerated. Track 25. One. It was so bad it really undermined his reputation. Two. You use a sort of brush thing to clean it. Three. When I switched it on, I found it had a fault. Four. You should have asked them to fix it. Five. The lower child mortality is, the lower the birth rate. Six. It was such typical double standards. Track 26. Conversation 1. What are you up to later? Oh, I'm going to a belly dancing class. You're doing what? Belly dancing. You know, like... Yeah, I know what it is. I just had no idea that you did that. Well, I don't really. It's actually the first class. Oh, OK. So, why belly dancing? I've been thinking about doing something to get a bit fitter, and I've never liked sport particularly. I find jogging and swimming and stuff like that a bit boring, you know. And then I saw this class advertised, and I thought it'd be fun. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> I should really do something as well. I've put on five kilos since January. Really? It doesn't look it. You've got a lovely figure. <laughs> well, I don't feel like I have. And I'm really unfit. I had to run for the bus this morning, and it took me about ten minutes to get my breath back. Well, why don't you come with me? Oh, I don't know. I think I'd feel a bit self-conscious. Oh, come on! You can't be worse than me. I'm totally uncoordinated. It'll be a laugh. Oh, well, maybe. Conversation 2 Are you around this weekend at all? No. I'm going to a fencing workshop all day Saturday. You're going where? This fencing workshop. It's like a master class with this top Russian fencer. Wow. I didn't even know you did fencing. How did you get into that? Oh, we actually used to do it at school. In PE, we had the option to try out all kinds of sports. And I just really got into it. And then I joined a club. And then I started competing a bit more seriously, you know. I had no idea. Well, what about Sunday? I'm going to have a wander around the flea market in the morning. But to be honest, I think I'm just going to have a lie-in and chill out at home. I'll be exhausted after Saturday. Fair enough. Just the thought of doing that kind of exercise makes me sweat. Conversation 3 
What are you doing this evening? Do you fancy meeting later? No, I can't. I've got my, um, my, um, knitting group tonight. You've got what? My knitting group. Since when? Oh, I've been doing it for about six months now. I took it up because I was giving up smoking and a friend suggested doing it. She said it would give me something to fiddle with instead of cigarettes. So I joined this group and it's been really good. I feel so much healthier now and I actually really like the knitting. I just find it very, very relaxing. OK. But isn't it just full of old women, this group? No, not at all. Well, I mean, I am the only man, but most of the women are quite young. Ah. What? What's ah supposed to mean? Nothing. Track 27. 1. You run how far? 2. You do what? 3. You went where? Four. She's into what? Five. You got up when? Track 28. One. I shouldn't have said anything. Two. We should have gone somewhere else. Three. It could have been much worse than it was. Four. It couldn't have come at a worse time. Five. It wouldn't have made any difference. Six. I would have scored that. Track 29. I must go and send my cousin an email in a minute. Oh, OK. I've been meaning to go round and see him because he's not been well. But Kyle's a bit reluctant to drive me round there because it'd mean spending time with my uncle. Really? What's wrong with him? He's just mad, that's all. He's not. He's just... Annoying? No. Crazy? Exhausting? Chloe, just ignore him. Kyle, you can be so horrible sometimes. Listen, Chloe, the last time we went to see him, he had a thing about handstands. We were sitting outside a cafe, just having a coffee and chatting, and he suddenly just got up and did a handstand, right next to all the tables. He kept it up for about half an hour. That does sound a bit odd. How old is he? About 50. 50? I told you, he's crazy. He is not. He's just one of these people who can't sit still. I mean, he's always loved sport, and when he does something new, he really gets into it. Like he took us ice skating once. Do you remember? How could I forget? I mean, we were exhausted after about an hour, but he just kept on skating, and we watched him going round and round for another hour. It was like he'd just completely forgotten we were there. Oh, and what about the hang gliding? Hang gliding? Yeah, he used to go hang gliding. Obsessed with it, he was. He went practically every weekend for about three years. Until he had an accident. He fell something like 1,000 metres without a parachute. You're joking. No, it's true. So what happened? Well, he'd borrowed someone else's glider for some reason, and they didn't have a parachute, but he went up anyway. And he was caught in really bad weather, and the hang glider broke and he fell. And he wasn't badly injured? Well, he went through some trees, which broke his fall. He had hairline fractures in his shoulder and his neck and some minor cuts and bruises, but basically he was OK. He was incredibly lucky he didn't die. Absolutely. Anyway, then we saw him about three weeks later roller skating in the park, even though he still had his neck in a brace. God, but he did give up the hang gliding after that. Not exactly, no. He tried it once more, to overcome any fear. I mean, he just wanted to prove to himself he could do it. But since then, no. 
the last few years, he's been really into windsurfing. He's actually always liked it. He did it when he was younger. But the last few years, that's been his main obsession. He lives on the coast, so he goes nearly every day. Right. I'm starting to think Kyle might be right. And you haven't heard all of it. For the last few months, he's been rubbing lemon juice into his skin and his hair every day. He says it gets rid of dandruff. And he was going on and on about how amazingly healthy it is. OK, OK, it's true. He is a little bit mad. He's a nice guy. And he's fun to be with. <laughs> In small doses. Track 30. One. Have you managed to buy the tickets? Two. I've been calling all morning. Three. I've been meaning to for ages. Four. Why has Wayne decided to leave? Five. He's been thinking about it for a while. Six. She's always been good at sports. Track 31. Conversation 1. Have you ever been to Hungary? Yeah. I went to the Ziggert Festival a couple of years ago. You went where? The Ziggert. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, but it's an enormous music festival in Budapest. It's held on this island in the middle of the Danube. Oh, right. So where did you stay? We camped on the festival site. It was a bit of a nightmare, actually, because it absolutely poured down while we were there. The whole place was flooded and we got absolutely soaked. Tents, sleeping bags, everything. And it was so muddy, everything got filthy. It was crazy. Couldn't you stay somewhere else? Well, we actually did in the end. We met these really nice Hungarians who lived in the city and they put us up for a couple of nights. Wow, that was generous. So, would you go again? Absolutely. We had a great time in spite of the weather. I hardly slept the whole time we were there. There was so much going on. Conversation 2 Did you go away in the holiday at all? Yeah, I went to Turkey. In August? Wasn't it a bit hot? Oh, it was absolutely boiling. But then I love the heat. And you get quite dry heat there. I guess. So did you enjoy it? Yeah, it was brilliant. We stayed in this absolutely amazing place on the south coast, right on top of the cliffs overlooking the ocean. Sounds nice. Oh, it was. Wait, I've got a picture of it somewhere on my mobile. Let's have a look. Wow, look at that sunset. That's stunning. I know. It was like that nearly every night. That's great. Were there any other places nearby? It looks as if it's in the middle of nowhere. It was a bit isolated, yeah. It was a few kilometres along this narrow track to the nearest village. Well, town. But they had a minibus to take people there in the morning and to bring them back in the evening. Wasn't that a pain, having to rely on the bus? Didn't they run more often than that? No. It was a bit annoying, but considering how cheap the place was, you couldn't complain. And there was a little beach near the hotel. There was a little path between the cliffs, and the beach was almost deserted, which was lovely. I'm not surprised. Sounds like hard work. It was a bit of a struggle climbing back up, but it was worth doing once. I guess. It doesn't sound like my kind of thing, though. Track 32. 1A. It was quite near the beach, which was good. 1B. It was quite near the beach, but I was expecting it to be nearer. 2A. The beach was a bit crowded, so we didn't go there much. 2B. The beach was a bit crowded, but there was still enough room to relax in. 3A. The surrounding area is fairly nice. It's very green and it's nice to hire a bike. 3B. The surrounding area is fairly nice. There are a few factories which kind of spoil it. 4A. The food was pretty good, which I wasn't expecting. 4B. The food was pretty good, although it was a bit too oily for my liking. Track 33. Conversation 1. I have a booking under the name of Bergen. Hmm. Uh, 
I'm sorry, sir. We have no record of any reservation. No, that can't be right. I spoke to someone just over a week ago. Uh, well, did you receive a confirmation by email or text? Should I have? That's our normal procedure, yes. No, I haven't had anything. Well, I'm afraid there's nothing I can do. Well, haven't you got any rooms available? I'm afraid not. Oh, that's great, that is. Conversation 2 uh, Hello. I was wondering if you could help. My room's not very warm. Is there any way I can turn down the air conditioning? I'm afraid it's all controlled centrally. Can't you do anything about it? I mean, you seem to have it on full blast. It's absolutely freezing. I'm sorry, but we haven't had any other complaints about it. Conversation 3 what do you mean you're not going to give us our deposit back? Look at the state of the place. It's filthy. Well, it wasn't particularly clean when we moved in. And what about the washing machine? That'll need to be replaced. Oh, that's hardly our fault. It's ancient. It was already falling apart. And I hardly think it's worth a whole month's rent. Well, it's the combination of things. When you take everything into account, the stuff which is broken and missing, the mess, it all adds up. What? To over a thousand pounds? You're taking the mickey. I can't believe you think we're going to pay that. It's ridiculous. Conversation four. I warned the landlord that boiler was a health hazard again and again. I know. I remember you telling me ages ago. They promised to fix it, but they just kept putting it off. Honestly, I'm furious about it. I'm not surprised. Still, you were right to have it checked and to get it repaired. I mean, you could have suffocated while you were sleeping. Well, you hear about carbon monoxide poisoning all the time, don't you? It doesn't bear thinking about. The thing is, though, I'm completely out of pocket now. Track 34 One often hears that something was a culture shock most often when people arrive in a new country, but also when they enter other kinds of new environments. However, it is usually described as being similar to jet lag, something which you experience for a couple of days and then get over. All you need is a good night's sleep. The reality is, however, that undergoing any big change, whether it's moving house, changing jobs or going to university, will bring about a culture shock. Far from being a single event which is quickly forgotten, it is a process which may take several months, even years, to fully recover from. Psychologists more commonly call this process acculturation and highlight four distinct phases that nearly everyone goes through. These are elation, the joy and wonder you first have, where everything is so new and different. Resistance, when things settle into a routine and you start to see everything which is bad in your new situation. You look back through rose-coloured glasses on your life before the change. This resistance is then followed by the transformation phase, where you swing more to the other extreme and start looking down on your previous existence and its culture. You may refuse to mix with people you used to know, or who speak the same language. You might put them down when you do. Finally, people reach a state of integration, where cultural differences are acknowledged and accepted, and people appreciate both their own heritage and their new life. That's the ideal situation, according to psychologist Perry Graves. Everyone goes through the initial stages, but not everyone finishes the complete cycle. This can cause problems because they often don't recognize the phases of acculturation. For example, some people drop out of university in their first year, saying they don't relate to the middle class values, or that it has nothing to do with reality and so on. In reality, these opinions are actually a symptom of the resistance stage. In other cases, people get stuck in a transformation phase, which may stop them moving on to new experiences or lead to them cutting themselves off from their roots, from people they've known for years and years. That can lead to a deep sense of unhappiness and to feelings of frustration. 
Track 35. 1. I've been meaning to go there for a while. Two. She's had her hair done. Three. I shouldn't have put it off for so long. Four. It was a bit of a nightmare, to be honest. Five. You should have told me. I could have dealt with it. Six. I've been struggling to keep up. Track 36. One. The thunder was so loud. Two. I thought I was going to pass out. Three. I thought I was going to freeze to death. Four. When we left, it was fine. Five. It was pouring down. Six. Because it was so strong. Seven. I was afraid of skidding. Eight. The whole place was flooded. Track 37. We got caught in this incredible storm on our way to visit friends in Rome. Yeah? Yeah, it was amazing. One moment we were in sunshine, the next we saw, like, a line on the road ahead, and we drove through it, and it was hail. Incredible. These enormous hailstones just are... They were as big as golf balls. Honestly, they were hitting the car so hard, they nearly broke the windscreen. Really? Well, maybe I'm exaggerating a bit, but they were pretty big, and it was pretty scary. I bet. And then the lightning started. It was lighting up the whole sky. In the end, we pulled over to the side of the road till it all blew over. Right. And then it cleared up again, almost as quickly as it had started. It's amazing, isn't it? It actually reminds me of a time I was in Sardinia. We were visiting this little village somewhere, the name of which escapes me. Actually, I guess we should have realised because it had been boiling all day, very humid and sticky. And then in the evening, we were just taking a walk along the beach. You get this great view across the bay to Alghero. Uh-huh. And anyway... Suddenly, we saw this incredible forked lightning across the bay, followed by a faint rumble of thunder, and it just continued. It was so spectacular, we were just, like, transfixed watching it, because, you know, it was still dry where we were. It was amazing. I could have watched it for hours. But then, suddenly, it started spitting. And then, just two seconds later, the heavens opened and it started pouring down. Oh, no. And, of course, we hadn't brought an umbrella or anything, so we just ran to the nearest cafe we could find. And, honestly, it can't have been more than a minute, but we got absolutely soaked. I must have poured something like a litre of water out of my shoes. Oh, my God. I swear, sitting there in the cafe, I think it was the wettest I've ever been. Track 38. One. Oh dear, those don't look very healthy. I know. I bought them to cheer up the flat a bit. You know, a, a bit of colour and greenery. But they just look depressing now. It's strange. I've been watering them every day. Maybe that's it. The soil's probably too wet. I think it rots the roots. You're joking. You mean I'm drowning them? I guess so. Two. What are these flowers? They're lovely. They're terrible. Why? What do you mean? They're just so invasive. They take over the whole place. None of the other plants can survive, and they're really difficult to get rid of as well. But they look so nice. Yeah, but they're not native to this country, and they're destroying the local varieties. That's too bad. I still like them, though. 
three. I wanted to take them something to say thank you for having me to stay, and so I bought some flowers. Fair enough. Anyway, I handed them over, and you know that feeling when you suddenly realise you've accidentally upset someone, yeah? She kind of gave me this tight smile and nodded, but, you know, they were quite a big bouquet. You kind of expect something different, yeah? Exactly. Anyway, she said something to her husband and he took him away and there was a bit of an awkward silence and then we just carried on with the evening. How weird! Yeah, I thought so. But then I was telling someone about it and they told me people there only give those flowers when someone's died. Oh no! It was like I was cursing her or something, hoping she'd have a funeral. Four. You're going to do what? Gather mushrooms. Isn't gather right? Yeah, yeah. Gather, pick, whatever. It's just, I don't know. I've never met anyone who does it. No. Everyone does it here in Poland. Why don't people do it in Britain? Well, it's dangerous, isn't it? Don't you worry about picking the wrong one and poisoning yourself? Some of them are lethal, aren't they? We are brought up doing this. We know from when we're children what's okay and what's not. And it's good. You feel more connected with nature. Last time we went, we saw a deer. Really close. Yeah? Wow. It sounds great. Five. Here, take this. It should help. What's in it? It's just a herbal tea my gran makes. It's basically fennel seeds and leaves with a touch of lemon and honey. She swears by it. I've never had fennel. It's nice. It's got an aniseedy kind of taste. It's great. It'll really settle your stomach. Track 39. 1A. There's an insect that attacks the roots of the tree, causing it to die. 1B. There are many problems affecting the country, but the root cause is the poor education system. 2A. I have several tomato plants on my balcony, but they're not doing very well. 2B. The film is basically about the police trying to find out where the bad guy has planted a bomb. 3A She worked as an actress for years without much success, but since winning the Oscar, her career is blossoming. 3B The best time to go is in spring, because of all the blossom on the trees. 4A most people agree that the economic crisis stemmed from mistakes made by the banks and the high level of private debt. 4B If you cut the stems of the flowers underwater, apparently the flowers last a lot longer. 5A We've had quite a lot of stormy weather recently, which has kept us indoors most of the time. 5B I'm not surprised they're breaking up. They had a very stormy relationship. Always fighting. 6A They had floods of complaints when it was first sold because it didn't work properly. 6B With all this rain, there have been quite a lot of floods. 7A I bought some seeds to grow some herbs in my kitchen, but I haven't planted them yet. 7B it's just the seed of an idea at the moment. I haven't really got very far developing it. Track 40. Conversation 1. How was your holiday? Fine. Apart from getting robbed. Oh, you're joking. What happened? Well, it was stupid, really. I should have been more careful. I was sitting in a cafe and these lads came up to me with a map asking for directions. I said I didn't understand and they walked off. Then I suddenly realised my bag was gone. Oh no! I'd left it under my chair and one of them must have grabbed it while they were talking to me. That's terrible. Did it have much in it? Fortunately not. My purse was in my pocket. Still, it can't have been very nice. Yeah, it was a bit upsetting, but I didn't let it spoil the holiday. Well, that's good. Conversation 2 who was that on the phone? It was the bank. They wanted to know if I'd spent $800 in Manila. Manila? That's like 5,000 kilometres away. 
I know. I guess someone must have got hold of my card details somehow. Sure, but how did they manage to get it halfway around the world? Apparently they have machines which can swipe the card and grab all your details. Then they just sell the details to whoever over the web. Right. So, have you got any idea of when it happened? No. I mean, it could have been when I bought those new trainers on the internet. But then again, it might equally have been in the local supermarket. You reckon? Maybe you should just pay for everything in cash. Yeah, right. That's not very practical. I'm just saying. Anyway, what about the money? Will you get it back? Yeah, they said it's fine. That must be a relief. It is. Conversation three. Uh, what are you reading? Oh, it's just about all these animals and stuff they've seized this year. Oh, right. No, it's incredible. Look at this picture. Oh, my word, that's awful. There's a whole elephant. Why would you want a whole stuffed elephant? I don't know, but it says it's worth 200,000, so someone with more money than sense. And a large living room. Exactly. Get this, though. Apparently, they raided a motel room and they found this guy with two live crocodiles in the bathroom and a lion in the back of a van outside. No. Yeah. Imagine if someone had gone in to clean the room. It'd be a bit of a shock. Do you think he was transporting them together? It sounds like it. I suppose he must have drugged them. They'd fight otherwise. I guess. Who do you think would win? I'd say the crocodile. Didn't you say there were two of them? Track 41. One. That's dreadful. Was anyone killed? Two. That must have been awful. Were you okay? Three. Oh, no. Did they take anything very valuable? Four. That's dreadful. What were the parents thinking? Five. What a shame. Were you insured? Six. That's terrible. Did you report it to the police? Seven. You're joking. Do they know who did it? Eight. It's awful. What must his family be going through? Track 42. There's nothing unusual in the idea that a film star should have learned their trade in the theatre. What is remarkable, though, is when that theatre is based in a prison and the film star is a convicted murderer serving a life sentence, only able to film on day release from jail. And Yellow Arena is not your average film star. He came into the public eye following his leading role in director Matteo Garone's 2012 film, Reality. In the film, Arena plays Luciano, a fish seller whose family encourage him to audition for the local version of the reality TV show Big Brother. After doing so, his obsession with achieving fame slowly turns into something far darker. He gradually descends into madness and comes to believe that his whole life has become part of some elaborate screen test. Reality explores how the entertainment industry can offer hope to the hopeless, but also suggests that the new life it seems to promise is ultimately an illusion. Obviously, it is possible to see parallels here with the real-life experience of Aniello Arena, as the world of crime also sells dreams that rarely, if ever, come true. Arena grew up in one of the poorer quarters of Naples and drifted into crime at a young age. He was jailed in the early 1990s for the murder of three members of a rival gang, though to this day he insists he is innocent of the offences, while freely acknowledging his criminal past. His initial involvement with acting came about when he first encountered the work of the Fortezza Theatre Company in prison. Established in 1988 by Armando Punzo, the group staged both classic and contemporary plays, with all roles played by prisoners. The company are based in the notorious Volterra prison, where they put on performances, but they have also toured the country. Punzo claims to see potential in the prisoners that maybe they are unaware of themselves. He believes that through drama, inmates have the opportunity to look inside themselves and deal with questions they would not otherwise attempt to address. This drama therapy has proved so successful that it has been exported to the jail of Rumier near Beirut in Lebanon. 
track 43. In many ways, the story of the Fortezza Theatre Company and the drama therapy it offers is in keeping with certain current trends. While public opinion often demands longer sentences and harsher conditions for those inside, hard manual labour and so on, research actually seems to suggest that if reoffending rates are to be cut, then a more enlightened approach gets the best results. Whilst an average of between 70 and 75% of prisoners released across Europe go on to commit crimes again, in Denmark, Sweden and Finland, the average rate is 30%. In Norway, it's a mere 20%. So what are the Scandinavians doing differently? Well, from the perspective of many Norwegians, the main problem with prisons is that we place too much emphasis on punishing prisoners and don't pay enough attention to rehabilitation. Norway has no death penalty and a maximum sentence of just 21 years and as a result embraces the fact that prisoners will one day be released back into society. The Norwegian approach to prison is best exemplified by Bostoy, the nation's only island jail. Here, prisoners are given personal responsibility and meaningful work, and have to deal with all the challenges this involves. As well as developing literacy skills, crucial given that being unable to read or write is often cited as one of the reasons why young people get involved in crime, prisoners are also able to learn everything from IT skills to skills such as carpentry or plumbing. All of this helps to ensure they are employable on their release and thus less likely to fall back into crime. In addition, on Bostoy, prisoners are able to meet and interact with normal members of society, further aiding their rehabilitation. As shocking as such liberal attitudes may seem to many, the results are so incredible that perhaps it is time for wider exploration of their implications. Track 44 1 Someone might have got hold of your details. Two. They must have broken in through the back door. Three. There's no point trying to look for them. Four. It was pouring down, and then it turned to hail. Five. I got soaked because I'd forgotten to bring a coat. Six. I was standing there, and this guy came up to me and grabbed my bag. Track 45. So how are you finding your job? Is it going okay? Oh, it's all right, I suppose. It's not what I want to do long term, though. No? How come? Oh, it's just so menial. I'm not using any of the skills I learned at university, and my boss is just dreadful. I seem to spend most of my time running round making him cups of tea and photocopying things. And if I ask about doing other stuff... He just tells me to be patient and then starts going on about how he did the same when he started at the company. Well, maybe it's true. Oh, I don't know. I was talking to this girl who joined at the same time as me, and she said she was learning loads in her department, being really stretched, apparently. Makes me think it's maybe more about me. Oh, I am sorry. If it's that bad, maybe you should think about handing in your notice. I don't know. I guess it might get better if I just give it a bit more time. Well, you'd think so. I mean, it is a big company, isn't it? Hmm, but maybe that's it, you see. Maybe it's a bit too big. Anyway, I can't see myself staying there long term. No? Well, if you do decide to make a move, you're bound to get lots of offers. <laughs> I don't know about that, but it's nice of you to say so. It's true. Track 46 well, anyway, what about you? How's your job going? Oh, you probably won't want to hear this, but it's great, yeah. It's going really well. Well, I'm glad at least one of us is happy anyway. Yeah, it's amazing. I've been getting loads of on-the-job training, and they've been letting me go into college one day a week as well to improve my skills. It's been really stimulating. I've also been meeting clients quite a bit. 
Oh, and I gave my first big presentation last week. Wow, sounds amazing. Did it go OK? Yeah, it went brilliantly. I've got my first business trip coming up next month to New York, and I'm applying for promotion at the moment too. Really? Already? Do you think you'll get it? Hopefully, yeah. But you never know, do you? Oh, you're bound to. From the sound of it, you're their star employee. I can just see you in five years' time running the entire firm. <laughs> and if the worst comes to the worst, I'll end up knocking on the door of your office begging you for a job. Track 47. 1. I doubt it. I'm not qualified enough. Two. I might. Stranger things have happened. Three. Probably not, but it's worth a try. Four. Hopefully. I really need the money. Five. I'm bound to. They're desperate for new staff at the moment. Track 48. Over the last half a century or more, delivering newspapers after school has been the first point of entry into the world of work for countless young people. Yet today, the paper boy is fast becoming a dying breed. For the first time, there are more adults delivering newspapers in the United States than young people. The steady shift from youth carriers to adults over the last few years is down to a number of factors. Newspapers want deliveries to take place in the mornings rather than afternoons after school hours, and more adults, particularly retired people, are grabbing the opportunity to earn some extra income to supplement their salaries or pensions. There are also those who blame the economic boom of the early noughties. Families could afford to buy more things for their kids, and so many kids settled for the comfort of a sofa and PlayStation rather than take to the streets to earn pocket money. Many delivery companies say adults are more reliable and provide a better service, but there are those who are saddened by the changes. Bud Keynes, managing director of the Milwaukee Herald, Doing a paper route when I was 13 was my first experience of business. It taught me responsibility, how to manage my time and communicate with people. More than once, I got soaked or froze to death or got chased by dogs, but it was character building. Too many young people these days enter what is a very competitive job market, lacking those basic business skills that you get from being a carrier. Track 49. 1. If I was better at maths, I would have studied physics. 2. I would never have become a CEO if I hadn't worked hard. 3. You might have noticed if you'd been paying more attention. 4. If I hadn't met her, I'd probably still be living at home. 5. If I'd heard something, I'd tell you. Six. I'd go with you if I could, but I can't. Track 50. Hello. Welcome, everyone. For those who don't know me already, I'm Kimi from Finland, and I'm here studying economics as part of the student exchange program. Today I'm going to talk about Pisa. So, hands up everyone who has heard of Pisa. OK, lots of you. Now, hands up everyone who thought I was talking about the Italian city with a leaning tower. <laughs> OK, well, I'm afraid you're wrong. No, this Pisa is the Programme for International Student Assessment, which is used to compare education systems round the world. So. What I'm going to do today is take a closer look at this project. I'll begin by explaining how PISA works, 
I'll then move on to look at and comment on some of the results before going on to conclude that, from a Finnish perspective, the results from PISA are not necessarily the most helpful way of measuring success. Track 51 OK, basically PISA consists of three tests in maths, science and reading, organised by the Organisation of Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD for short. The tests were first run in 2000 and are set every three years. Currently, around half a million 15-year-olds from 65 different countries take part. Each test is marked out of 800 and the average marks for each country's students gives the country's rank. The idea is that to compete economically, you need to improve education. So, moving on to the results. The table here shows a selection of countries from the last PISA test for maths. As you can see, China's almost 100 points ahead of my country, Finland. Such a big difference may be down to better education, but it may also be because of the kinds of kids who were tested. Unlike all the other countries, China's students all came from a single city, in this case, Shanghai. More importantly, focusing on rank is a problem. Finland, for example, has fallen from being best in 2000. I've seen some headlines here saying, the miracle is over, and plunging standards. But there were only 40 countries taking part in 2000, not 65. And our score has actually dropped by just 3%. Not exactly plunging. When you look at percentages, instead of points out of 800, you may also note that although we are 22 places and 37 points ahead of Russia, that's actually only about 4%. So, should we care about PISA? I guess it's good to have an independent test, but I don't think we should change our education to get better marks in it. These marks don't really tell you what education is like. In South Korea... Kids typically study 12 or more hours a day, and we sometimes do half that. I know where I'd prefer to study. <laughs> and does it really matter in terms of the economy? Qatar is the richest country in the world, but comes almost bottom of the table. In short, I think we should decide what we as a country want from education, and avoid comparisons. Track 52 what I'm going to try and do today is take a look at McDonald's recent performance. I'll begin by commenting on their sales figures for the last five years. I'll then move on to some recommendations about how the company could improve things in the years to come. Track 53 So how much longer have you got? Three more days. By four o'clock Friday, we'll have finished every single one. I can't wait. Me neither. The physics one yesterday was a nightmare. I know. I'm sure I failed it. You must be sick of it all. I am. If I revise much more, my head's going to explode. Just keep telling yourself, three more days, three more days. So shall we go out and celebrate on Friday then? That sounds like an excellent idea. Yeah, I'd be up for that as well. Do you have anywhere in mind? Mm, I thought that Equinox might be fun. Where's that? Oh, don't you know it? It's the big disco on the main square in town. It's great. If you like that kind of place, I have to say it's not my kind of thing. I can't stand the music down there. And besides, it's full of horrible guys. Oh, I thought it was okay when I went there, but if you'd rather go somewhere else, that's fine by me. Well, personally, I'd quite like to get something to eat at some point, if that's all right with you. Yeah, that sounds good. Any thoughts on where? Well, Rico's is always a good bet. Oh, it's such a rip-off, that place. Last time I went there, I spent something like 60 euros. Can't we go somewhere cheaper? How about that Brazilian place near the station? Guanabara? Yeah, that'd be fine with me. Blinder? Yeah, whatever. I'm easy. They have music later on down there, don't they? Yeah, they do salsa after 10. It sounds ideal. So what time do you want to meet? 7? 7, 7.30? 7 
I'm working till six, and it'd be nice if I could go home first. So could we make it eight? I'll have had time to get changed and freshen up a bit by then. Yeah, fine. And I'll phone and book a table, just to be on the safe side. Okay. I'll ring a few other people and see if anyone else is up for it. And see you down there. Okay, brilliant. Bye. Bye. Track 54. Conversation 1. Sorry, but you couldn't pass me the salt, could you? Thank you. They look nice. They are. They're lovely. Have you tried that aubergine dip? It's delicious. Hmm. <laughs> I have to say, I'm not that keen on aubergines. There's something wrong with them as a vegetable. You're joking. Aubergines, they're the king of vegetables. Although, strictly speaking, of course, they're technically a fruit. Hmm. They're so versatile. You can fry them, grill them, have them mashed, stuffed, barbecued. Right. Did you know that they used to use the skin as a dye? The Chinese apparently used to polish their teeth with it. Fascinating. I can see I've not given aubergines a proper chance. Anyway, listen. Sorry, but I've just seen my friend Mercedes. I must just go and grab her. I've been meaning to talk to her all evening. Bye. Conversation 2 So, how do you know Niall? Who? Uh, the person whose party this is. Oh, right. Well, he's like the friend of a friend of my flatmate. I don't know why I'm here, really. I feel a bit left out. My flatmate dragged me here because she thought she wouldn't know anyone, and now she's met someone. Uh, oh, that's her over there, with that blonde guy. I, I think I might just go. How do you know Niall, anyway? I'm his fiance. You did know this is a party to celebrate our engagement, didn't you? No. Uh, actually, I didn't. Congratulations, though. It's a great party. Conversation 3 I'm glad I'm not the only person who couldn't stand it anymore. Tell me about it. It was so stuffy in there, wasn't it? You could hardly breathe. Yeah, they need some air conditioning or something. The speaker wasn't exactly helping either, was he? I thought I was going to fall asleep at one point there. Yeah, he's very dull, isn't he? I think I might just go and grab a coffee instead of going back in. That sounds like a good idea. Do you mind if I join you? Conversation 4 Is this the queue for the toilet? I'm afraid so. I love your top. Oh, thanks. It's quite unusual. Where did you get it? I actually picked it up in a second-hand clothes stall. It was only five pounds. Really? That's fantastic. I never bother looking in places like that. I mean, there's a second-hand place near me, but the stuff in there always looks in pretty poor condition. That looks brand new, though. I think it's quite old, actually, but the stall I got it from is just fantastic. Just really nice stuff. Mind you. It's so difficult getting stuff in my size. I can imagine. <laughs> it must be hard. I've got a friend who's maybe your height and she's always moaning about it as well. That dress is lovely though. It's great, isn't it? I actually just found this place online. Oh look, it's your turn. Conversation 5 Sorry, but I couldn't help overhearing. Did you say you've just come back from Accra? Yeah. Why, do you know it? Yes, quite well, actually. I spent two years there back in the 90s. Wow. What were you doing there? My husband was based at the embassy there, so... Really? It must have been quite different back then. It's a real boom town at the moment. So I've read, yes. It was relatively quiet when we were there, and the infrastructure was still very much a work in progress, but we loved it. We met some wonderful people there, and were able to see a bit of the countryside as well. I'm sure it's changed a lot, though. For sure. It's attracting a huge amount of inward investment. In fact, my firm is planning to open an office there, so I was over there sorting that out. Oh, that's great. I'm really pleased to hear it. Anyway, sorry, I didn't want to stop you chatting. Track 55 1. Miserable weather, isn't it? Yeah, awful. It's been like this for weeks now, hasn't it? I know. I can't remember when I last saw the sun. 
too. You don't remember me, do you? It's Yuka, isn't it? No, it's Naomi. Three. Excuse me, you haven't got a light, have you? Yeah, here you go. Thanks. You couldn't lend me a pound, could you? No, sorry. Four. You missed the class on Monday, didn't you? There wasn't one, was there? The school was closed for the holiday, wasn't it? No, mind you, you didn't miss much. It was quite boring. Well, to be honest, the whole course is a bit disappointing, isn't it? Five. I love that jacket. It's from Zara, isn't it? No, I got it from a shop called Monsoon. Really? You wouldn't happen to have the address, would you? No, sorry. I honestly can't remember. Track 56. 1. If you're struggling to cope, maybe you should delegate more. 2. I guess things will improve once I get the hang of the new system. 3. If the worst comes to the worst, you'll just have to hand in your notice. 4. It was a shame all that food went to waste, wasn't it? 5. If it hadn't been for her, I wouldn't be where I am today. Six. With anyone else, I would have felt awkward if they'd said that. Track 57. Hi. How can I help you today? Hi. I reserved a car online. Here's my voucher and my driving license. Yep. OK. Let's have a look. Right, we have your car ready, but we're running a special offer this week. You can upgrade to the next range for just two euros a day. So you could have an estate car if you like. It's OK. We don't have much luggage. Are you sure? It's a bit more powerful as well. No, I think something smaller, uh, more fuel efficient is OK. Fine. You ordered GPS, yes? That's right. OK. Would you like our additional insurance cover for damage to tyres and windscreen? Isn't that already included in what I paid for online? No. I think it's in the small print, and this is only three euros extra a day. What are the chances of anything going wrong? Well, it's up to you, but uh, better safe than sorry, isn't it? Uh, I suppose so. Uh, OK, then. It is quite cheap. Fine. Can I just have your credit card? That's for the insurance, the cost of the fuel, and also your deposit on the car, which is returnable when you bring the car back. Right. So, should I return the tank full? No, there's no need. But it is full now. It's diesel, by the way. OK. So, could you just sign where I've marked with a cross? You may want to check the car as well before you leave. There are some scratches here and here, and a small dent in the rear door. OK, great. Have a good trip. Track 58 Hello, right car rentals? Oh, hello. I wonder if you can help me. My name's John Farnham. I was in this morning and picked up a car from you. Oh, hello, Mr. Farnham. How's it going? Uh, not that well, to be honest. I'm actually calling because we have a problem with the car. I was driving along the motorway and something flew up at the windscreen and cracked it. Oh, I am sorry to hear that. How bad is it? Uh, quite bad. It's a very big crack. Uh, I'm uncomfortable driving with it like this. OK, I totally understand. Uh, you'll need to ring our breakdown service. The number is written in the book that came with the car. Oh, OK, I'll do that now. Um, how long do you think they will be? Uh, we guarantee they'll be with you within four hours. Four hours? Is that really the best you can do? Well, it's usually less. Still, at least you've got insurance. Track 59. 1. The taxi fare to your hotel will be a hundred euros. A hundred euros? That's expensive. 2. The cheapest ticket we have left is $875. $875? If that's the cheapest, I'd dread to think how much the most expensive is. 3. Our flight leaves at 5 in the morning. Five in the morning. That's going to be a killer. Four. 
It's a bit old, but it's a nice car. I could let you have it for 1500 1500 I was thinking more like 150 personally. Five. If you just wait at the station, I should be able to get there within an hour or two. An hour or two? It'd be quicker for me to walk. Six. I'm afraid the contract does state that there's a 50 euro penalty if you return the car more than an hour late. 50 euros? Where on earth does it say that? Track 60. Lily, what's up? You look really fed up. I just got a parking ticket. Oh no, that's so annoying. Where were you parked? Just round the corner. But what's really irritating is the fact it happened when I'd actually gone to look for change for the machine. You're joking. No. I parked my car and then I suddenly realised I only had notes. There was no one around, so I went off to a shop to get change. And when I got back... <sighs> That's terrible. Didn't you see who gave you the ticket? I did look, but they'd vanished. They can't have been there long. I think they must have run away to avoid any arguments. <laughs> Probably. Couldn't you appeal? It's not worth it. In the end, it's basically my word against theirs. I know. You'd never win that one. How much is the fine? Eighty pounds. And I got a speeding ticket the other day after I got flashed by a speed camera. That was another eighty and three points on my licence. Oh, Lily. Poor you. They're so strict on these things. But it's so over the top. I mean, I was only doing three or four miles over the speed limit. What annoys me is the fact that people who are essentially honest are treated like criminals for these little things. I know. And it's not as though people drive that fast here. You should go to Iran. You take your life in your hands driving there. People, they go so fast, but really close behind you. And they don't use their brakes. They just flash their lights. No, oh, it's horrible when people do that. I don't know about Iran, but I have to say, I drove through Paris last year and that was terrifying. There were like six lanes and everyone was swerving in and out of the lanes. I got cut up a couple of times and I had to brake, but then people were sounding their horns at me. <laughs> you see? That kind of thing doesn't happen so often here. People really are more polite here. The thing that amazed me when I first came here was the fact that people actually stopped for pedestrians at crossings. That hardly ever happens back home. You have to be really careful not to get run over. It can't be that bad, can it? Drivers here can be very inconsiderate, and I've had plenty of people swearing at me in London. Believe me, it's nothing compared to Tehran. Sometimes there, you're not even safe on the pavement. People ignore stop signs, go through red lights. Honestly, it's anarchy. 